Yeah. Well, thanks again uh, for this opportunity to talk about um, my kind of travails and, and journey through uh, a PhD at Berkeley, uh, which was a bit unique. Um, so I'll be talking about that. And this presentation is really about, um, I think, what it takes to explore uh, genuinely interdisciplinary questions uh, at a place like Berkeley, which is to say at one of the world's leading research universities. Um, you know, there is this kind of essential tension or paradox in that where um, being at a place like Berkeley, there's such a, a wealth of, of resources in terms of classes, in terms of faculty, in terms of just ideas, the heatiness of the place. Um, but at the same time, uh, for that reason, uh, you have to have very good reason uh, to really pioneer uh, and pursue something new, something that hasn't been done before. Um, and there's this tension between drawing on that wealth of those resources, but also leveraging and mobilizing them in a direction that they have not yet been applied before. Uh, and that's really the story of my PhD at a high level. And so I'll be going through some of the story beats of that um, and how I eventually just learned to accept uh, the difficulty of that and the difficulty of what it means to be a leader uh, at a place like Berkeley, uh, even as a graduate student. So uh, starting off, uh, we're going to go back in time a little bit to 2015, 2016, the mid-2010s, uh, back when people were still talking about AI mostly as a hypothetical, as something that was kind of abstractly very exciting, that was on the horizon uh, that we might someday have to worry about um, in terms of practicalities. Uh, but the ideas about it remained very kind of high level um, and yet also very exciting. And at Berkeley, uh, I was already seeing this kind of foment around two very different approaches to what it would even mean to ask, uh, you know, how do we build AI in a beneficial way? AI that benefits people is good for society. Uh, and, you know, that can basically be traced, uh, materially speaking, to either the north end of campus or the south end of campus. <laughs> so those of you who know uh, the way Berkeley is laid out, you know, the, the, the EECS program uh, is largely ensconced uh, near, near, near Euclid, uh, so near a set of buildings around uh, the north side of the campus, uh, whereas the social sciences and the humanities uh, are largely on the southern tip uh, at kind of straddling Telegraph Avenue. So there's kind of a Euclid versus Telegraph story in some ways. Um, anyway, the, the first of those schools uh, was really trying to develop this approach, which it was calling, which came to be called AI safety. And AI safety is really a way of approaching this question as asking, well, um, what formal methods and tools would we need to build systems that are provably beneficial. Uh, in other words, what are the mathematical proofs or techniques that once developed would guarantee that a system would perform optimally and as specified in a way that would provide utility, uh, in other words, welfare or the good in a kind of economic sense uh, to people. And that was really being launched by a, a few research labs and, and the major one I'll talk a little bit about, about more later, uh, but there were many people who were kind of getting on board with that program. And then there was a very different approach, uh, the, the, let's call it the Telegraph School for purpose of this talk, uh, which was arguing that instead, like, no, what it means to build AI systems to be good means that people should have the right to reject them if they want. Uh, in other words, these systems should be robustly accountable to the people they are meant to serve. People should have a choice to determine for themselves uh, whether or not this, this thing is good for them, even once it's deployed. Um, if I'm using self-driving cars or they're deployed in my neighborhood and they're worsening traffic or they don't recognize everyone the same, uh, or they're not providing equal access to different kinds of people, that's a problem. And they can they should be able to be refused if possible. So there was this sense that building beneficial AI was a kind of explicitly political question and would require ordinary people 
to organize themselves to uh, contest the terms on which computer scientists, engineers, mathematicians were, however, you know, well, they were trying to do it, that, that there was a grounds on which to say, you guys don't actually know what you're doing. Uh, you guys don't actually can't predict what we want in advance of our articulating it. Um, so I was kind of intellectually and also to some extent physically straddling uh, both of these communities. Uh, so I was taking classes uh, on both the south side and the north side of campus. And what I really wanted to do was come up with a new way of understanding this question, making sense of it, uh, that wasn't necessarily ensconced in either of these you know, independently very rigorous, but uh, incommensurable ways of of tackling what seemed to me a problem so important that that the stakes demanded a larger approach. Uh, and so, you know, I should clarify my background originally is in philosophy. And so my impulse, uh, as usual, uh, was to go back to the kind of foundations of of Western political thought uh, and Western epistemology. And so that kind of naturally led me back to a question of you know, well, what what is deliberation? When we think about AI systems, uh, what you're usually trying to do is simulate thinking. You're trying to take the way we that an intelligent agent comes to a decision, and you're trying to simulate that either in terms of a neural network or in terms of some other trusted learning algorithm. And you're trying to optimize that in a way that more or less conforms to like, yes, that is a perfectly rational agent. And that's interesting to me, because if you look at the history of Western thought, there's many different ways of modeling deliberation. Um, the computational approach is really quite recent. Uh, if you look back over the centuries, uh, whether that's the kind of ancient assemblies of Greece and Rome, uh, the kind of modern constitutional republics, one of which we now live in, uh, the way in which modern science took off in the scientific revolution, deliberation is understood very differently and enacted very differently in those different fields. And so what, what was really interesting to me was how it didn't seem to me that computer scientists were being very deeply reflective about how many plur plural notions of deliberation there have been uh, in this history that we all still depend on in order for society to function effectively. And so what I really tried to zero in on was, okay, what would a richer theory of deliberation mean? Um, now, as it, as it turns out, um, that that really kind of led me initially up a rabbit hole. Because if you look at the existing theories of deliberation that animate computer science, um, they're not very good. <laughs> they're, not, they're not very deep. They're not very reflective. Um, most of them, frankly, are kind of inspired by um, pretty abstract and contrived thought experiments like trolley problems. Uh, or, you know, if then statements or some naive understanding of how if you scale a system to be big enough, it becomes smart. Um, I'm sorry to say that idea has only become more popular as language models have now entered the public sphere and become very influential. Um, and, you know, th there really is a kind of almost pride in not being very reflective about this question uh, that I found. And so it struck me that there needed to be this was not just an intellectual question. This was also to some extent a sociological question about how, how do we reform the practices of computer science and of engineering uh, so that we are even in a position to take this seriously, that we have incentive, we have reason to revisit this concept as a community and not just for me as a kind of, um, you know, erudite philosopher arguing in a vacuum. And that led me in two directions. One was a kind of particular intellectual methodology, which is not really the focus of this talk, but it was the focus of my dissertation. So I feel obligated to touch on it briefly. Uh, and that methodology basically rested on this idea that we need a way to approach deliberation as a, a form of calculation, a form of thinking that is organic and not, not strictly mechanical. It's not strictly something that machines can do, uh, that it really is about the way in which uh, we are able to model something as as having parts that stand in relation to some whole. Uh, when I deliberate, when I come to a decision, I'm, I'm willing to take some practical action in the world that is reflective of my deeper commitments and priorities, even if those priorities might take very different forms in different parts of my life. Um, and this was sort of the underlying intuition where I thought, you know, infinite scalability, more data, more modeling, more simulation 
could not get you all the way to understanding the subtleties of that perspective. And what was interesting about AI is that what it would enable, actually what it enables is for, for us to deliberate in new ways. It's not just that it automates deliberation by just simulating how we are able to think and doing it better. It's that by integrating AI into more and more different human activities, we are given the opportunity to uh, engage, re-engage the question of how we want those activities to be organized. So when you're, the example I always give is that when you're automating driving, when you're building self-driving cars, it's not really just that you're simulating how a human drives. It's that implicitly you're reorganizing what it means to drive in relationship with roads, in relationship with other cars, in relationship with cities. You're implicitly reorganizing the transportation system when you're automating particular components of that system. And that's really what cars are. They're components of a much larger transportation system. And so a lot of my research ended up kind of exploring that, that substantive question. But in parallel to that, and this is really more the thematic undercurrent of my, you know, Euclid versus Telegraph story uh, is that there needed to be a new kind of community around these questions, that the communities that are needed to seriously interrogate this did not yet exist. Um, and I knew I couldn't do it alone. I had these very deep intuitions, which came from my earlier training, largely in the humanities and social sciences, although I had a STEM background as well. Um, and I knew I would need to get a much more diverse set of people on board uh, to help turn this into an actual research agenda. And so what that led me to this inst this more institutional problem, not a research problem, uh, but more this question of how how is it that I could even build community around these kind of critically underexplored topics in AI ethics and governance uh, when people are instead incentivized to either buy into one of these, you know, two rival camps that are more interested in throwing stones at a glass house than they are in building something new, something sustainable. Uh, and, and that, that was kind of really this more kind of emotional journey for me was, was trying to find a home that, that didn't exist yet to, to do this work, um, at a very high level speeding through the next five years of my life from 2016, uh, I did a bunch of things in both of those directions. So there's a lot of information on this slide. I'll just touch on it briefly. Uh, I was primarily based for my field work at the Center for Human Compatible AI, uh, affectionately called CHI for short. Uh, CHI was one of the leading, is one of the leading labs at UC Berkeley that, that's doing this technical work on AI safety. Um, and it's one of the leading research labs in that field. Um, I also did many different interviews with people working in the, in the self-driving car industry uh, in support of, that was sort of the empirical aspect of my research. But then in addition to that, I did a lot of community initiatives. Um, one was founding Pearls, uh, which I'll talk more about in, in the presentation in just a moment. Uh, I co-designed uh, the very first interdisciplinary graduate seminar on beneficial AI. Uh, so there was no syllabus for this. Uh, there was no pedagogy for this. There was no notion of what it would mean to teach people on it, let alone even what good work there was in this space. And I, I and Stuart Russell kind of jumped in and just sort of said, well, somebody has to do it. It might as well be us. And so this was one of the last things I did in my PhD was, was co-design this course with Stuart uh, and a few other faculty at Berkeley from economics and philosophy uh, and political science as well. Um, and in tandem with this, all, all this work I was doing was many just collaborations with the research community at Berkeley as a whole. I mean, Ber Berkeley's embarrassment of riches really is the graduate community. I mean, just the thousands of graduate students who are individually brilliant and collectively uh, kind of beyond uh, comprehension in terms of the, the 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 sheer wealth of resources that they have to bear. And so a lot of what I was doing in this work was um, just putting myself in a position to draw from those resources uh, and putting myself in a position to evaluate how those resources could be, again, kind of leveraged in this in this newly creative way to push questions and ideas and methods that in my view, did not yet have the oxygen they needed to, to really thrive and succeed on their own terms. So again, the goal for me was to kind of investigate and evaluate how it is that these research groups are making choices about the systems that they're building, and in so doing, help them understand that they are making these choices, uh, that there are fundamental, you know, normative questions, ethical questions at the heart of building systems to be good. Um, 
that you shouldn't just point out uh, will inevitably fail, uh, that you should actually help these groups uh, to do that work in the public interest, whatever that means. And and there's a vulnerability in that that I think needed there needed to be space to admit. So I think the most important stuff I ended up doing at Berkeley was was just that was creating these spaces in which practitioners, engineers, computer scientists, uh, designers gave themselves permission to be vulnerable. Um, inviting that, inviting a kind of reflection, inviting a kind of questioning of, well, why are you building this system? Are you just doing it because you're a nerd and you think it's fun or quirky or interesting, or you wonder if this model can converge? <laughs> or are you actually doing it because you think that people will benefit from it? Do you actually think that they will? Do you know those people? Have you talked to them? Why do you have reason to think that that they would enjoy this, that, that it would make them flourish and not just you know, help them maybe save a few dollars on their next grocery bill or something like that. Um, and so one of the first kind of thrusts I did in that direction was co-found uh, this group called GEESE. Uh, it has a long acronym that I'm not going to bother to read aloud because it's really not important. <laughs> uh, but GEESE uh, was a, a kind of subgroup of us um, who, uh, and I'll just try and see if I can show the faces there. Uh, these five people on the side uh, who... Um, Several of whom I met in a class taught by Moritz Hart, who uh, was teaching a class on the north end of campus uh, called uh, Fairness in Machine Learning. So it was really about uh, what it would mean to make machine learning systems that are fair, uh, a system that's giving you a credit score. How do you know that it's fair? How do you know that it's giving you the credit score you deserve, not just one that can be safely predicted? Um, that seemed to me really important and compelling, although most of the class was pretty strictly mathematical and computational and formal. And uh, several of us were kind of like, our eyes were kind of occasionally, frankly, glazing over during some of these lectures because it was so dry and so non-substantive. We never actually discussed values uh, in any in any serious way. And over the course of the semester, we found ourselves kind of making eye contact with each other uh, as our eyes were glazing over being like, um, yeah, what would it mean to ask these questions about like substantively what should fairness mean? in the context of this machine learning system that we're considering right now. And so several of us founded this group, uh, which as this slide indicates, you know, we had this kind of mission to, to develop community amongst graduate students and postdocs who are interested in working at the intersection between these different fields, uh, to front these questions, take them seriously, not make them an afterthought, but to kind of force ourselves to confront them. And in that regard, to confront our own practices. Uh, to really give us, again, give ourselves permission to maybe admit things like, honestly, I'm not sure we should build this system, or I'm not sure we have sufficient reason to. What would what would we need to do to make sure that there was a good reason to build this system? Wouldn't that be fair? Wouldn't that be more appropriate uh, than just sort of naively thinking that we can just add constraints to this model and, and, and wash our hands of it? Um, and we really kind of explored you know, different options for forming collaborations and affiliations across Berkeley over the next several years. Um, and I'm proud to say that Geese is still still thriving. We still have regular calls. Uh, I believe Nate is also uh, actually in H2H8 as an explorer. So uh, the spirit of Geese, um, you know, lives on in that regard. Uh, beyond Geese, I want to spend a few minutes talking about Pearls. Uh, it has a somewhat less unwieldy acronym but still pretty jargony. So PEARL stands for the Political Economy of Reinforcement Learning Systems. This is a group I founded, uh, and I founded this during COVID, uh, actually in the worst part of COVID, when we were all uh, isolated at home uh, and we were all kind of asking, okay, what, what is even tomorrow going to bring, let alone what is AI going to bring? And I'm really proud of PEARLs uh, as a community that I explicitly founded to not just make space for vulnerability, but actually to, to challenge some very basic ideas that were guiding the, the most basic understanding that many, many AI theorists had about what it would mean to build systems that were good for people. Um, so I'll, I'll just very briefly talk about the substance of like why I was motivated to ask these questions. So many AI theorists believe that reinforcement learning as distinct from machine learning is the path to generally capable systems, generally intelligent systems. So very briefly, the difference between reinforcement learning and other kinds of machine learning is that in, 
in other in in garden variety machine learning, usually what you're trying to do is predict something. You have a lot of data. Insights are being kind of drawn from the data, and that allows you to predict something like, "What am I likely to engage with on Twitter? What am I likely to click or retweet?" Uh, what kind of credit score do am I likely to get based off of my future consumer patterns? Uh, what kinds of prices am I willing to pay for Uber or Lyft based off of rides I've taken in the past, and so on? In reinforcement learning, instead, what you're doing is you're building an agent that's trying to navigate an environment. So it's not trying to just predict. What it's trying to do is adopt behaviors over time. That in this much kind of richer way approximate intelligent behavior in the context of some problem. So that would be something like, how is it that I? How is it, for example, that you could show me a certain sequence of things on Twitter that would make me more likely to log on to Twitter in the future, like to spend more of my life on Twitter? It's a much richer kind of frame. You're not just trying to predict t plus one. You're trying to kind of shape. This kind of behavior over time, so that whatever it is you're trying to achieve, the goal of that is maximized. Uh, and it's much more about redefining activities rather than just uh, taking the next optimal action. Uh, so, one of the most provocative ideas within the reinforcement learning community. So, there's a whole community of reinforcement learning uh, researchers at Berkeley. I should say, I think Berkeley is affectionately known as the mothership of reinforcement learning research, and many people have gone on to, to propagate RL elsewhere after graduating. One of the most provocative ideas within it was this idea of the reward hypothesis. It's subsequently been uh, updated a bit, but when I was doing my PhD, there was this idea that, uh, all as I wrote it out here, all of what we mean by goals and purposes, in other words, all of what it means to actually be intelligent, for anything to be intelligent, is basically reinforcement learning. So it's basically just the optimal pursuit of maximizing reward, some carrot that is being dangled in some environment and just optimally chasing after that carrot. That's all it means to be intelligent. It doesn't matter what you're doing. You're writing a novel, you're deciding what to eat for dinner, you're deciding whether or not to get married or who to get married to. You're any any action, any any behavior that is intelligent would conform to this modeling assumption. That's the idea. And many people were converted by this. It's still a very, actually very influential idea. Uh, Rich Sutton, the formulator of it, is a, has collaborated with researchers at DeepMind, one of the world's leading AI companies, and they later wrote a paper that expanded on this. Uh, it has many followers. Uh, what, what disturbed me about the reward hypothesis was this idea uh, that, if you can see this here, that when you actually, if you, if you apply this to real systems, I think there's a tension where the designer is going to become more interested in optimizing the system than they are in making that system conform to the interests of real people, actual stakeholders. So I have a quote here from Andrew Ng, a very prominent machine learning advocate who, as he expresses in this quote, uh, what he's saying here basically is that actually ultimately what it means to make self-driving cars safe um, does not just mean you make the technology safe. It means that you make the environment safe in which the car is operating. So in other words, if we get pedestrians to follow the law and make them police and control their own behavior, uh, then actually it's a lot easier to build and deploy self-driving cars uh, because then they don't have to compensate for every possible thing that could happen in the environment. And so there's this tension that I didn't see the reward hypothesis as able to handle on its own, where uh, the agent is basically learning to control and operate optimally within an environment, rather than actually engaging the question of like, well, how do we want that environment itself to work? What is the environment in which this agent is expected to learn? What if there isn't a single notion of intelligence uh, that could operate within that environment? What if it's not just a scalar reward? What if there are different rewards? That could be baked into that environment, and we have to might maybe we have to choose between them as humans, uh, which is not something that you would trust or ever have an AI could be able to do that. At least not the ones that are being designed right now. So I was very curious about this, and what I decided to do, and this this was building off of geese. So geese kind of we kind of siphoned some energy from geese into into pearls itself. And Pearls was initially a reading group on this topic. So we read papers by Rich Sutton 
and other people while I was based originally at the Simons Institute, which is also on the Berkeley campus, the Simons Institute for the Theory of Computing. And the goal of this was, again, to basically say, like, OK, um, do we actually believe this hypothesis? And if we do, uh, where might it start to run into problems? Could you actually build a real system that would conform to it? If not, why? What other information or other guidance could you get in order to refine the hypothesis uh, in terms of its application to a specific self-driving car, a specific set of roads, a specific, you know, whatever, even beyond self-driving? Um, and that eventually led actually to a workshop that we did at NeurIPS, uh, which is one of the world's kind of leading machine learning AI conferences. We did a, we did a Pearls workshop. Uh, in 2021, and I'm now proud to say Pearls is going to relaunch uh, in 2023 very soon uh, to continue these topics. So it really germinated this very robust community of people, primarily at Berkeley, but then it expanded to include many researchers from across the country, also in Canada. Uh, some European researchers joined uh, anyone who wanted to really think critically about these questions together. And what that finally led to was the um, the second chapter of my thesis, which was not something I expected. Uh, so thanks to the the energy and the wherewithal of this of this of this community, uh, I kind of gained the confidence to write up my own thoughts on the reward hypothesis and and in the context of pearls. And so I kind of defined pearls formally as um, the science of determining the limits of the reward hypothesis for a given domain. So in other words, if you want to deploy a self driving car that is using reinforcement learning to learn the optimal behavior for navigating the streets of San Francisco. Um, if you do that naively, you're probably going to fail. But if you do that, at least by comparing, you know, how did traffic work before we deployed it in San Francisco? How does that compare to the way self-driving cars have already been deployed in Arizona? Uh, how might that also compare to the way they could be deployed in New York or Boston? Uh, when you transform this into a comparative question, an empirical question, and you bring uh, a more controlled set of design strategies, many of which I was taking from social science, the social sciences, uh, to apply to this, then it's not a matter of rejecting the reward hypothesis or just kind of endorsing it. It's a matter of falsifying it, because that's what science is. It's testing hypotheses that you believe, but that you ultimately are willing to abandon if needed or remake on the crucible of empirical inquiry. Um, and so this this really kind of developed into this new perspective, even on the foundations of of AI ethics topics uh, that I was I was very gratified to to see and 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 gain from this community that I helped to form. Um, and so that just led, and I'll just kind of skim over this slide a more specific set of ideas about okay, how would you then apply this to corporate governance if an AI system is being deployed by OpenAI or DeepMind or even even Google or you know, really any other machine learning company, how should they think about their corporate responsibilities to the domain if they're pursuing a hypothesis like this? And so we had these ideas that as a community, we developed around how do you preserve the integrity of the domain, the integrity of roads? How do you make your system interoperable with the other systems that operate on those roads, other cars, traffic signaling, municipal planners, other stakeholders need to be brought in actually in order to corroborate your hypothesis, your hypothesis about what this reward function for driving should be. Um, and there were many other in the discussion group, we explored many implications of this for uh, lots of different kinds of systems. So not just cars, uh, but also drones. Um, so other researchers in Pearls knew more about drones. Nate actually, his, his PhD thesis was on drones. Uh, so we had many productive conversations about this. Uh, we talked about the medical domain and applications there. Reinforcement learning is already being used to recommend drug treatments to patients uh, in certain in certain settings. Uh, and also, of course, finally, recommender systems. So uh, reinforcement learning is now and has been used uh, for some years to simulate how it is that Twitter should show you certain kinds of content and on Facebook what news stories appear in your news feed. And then it's also now, now this just in the past few months, very prominently used uh, in chatbots and, and kind of generative models for language and images like uh, like chat GPT uh, and stable diffusion and, and Dolly are kind of making use of reinforcement learning um, in these very interesting ways, but these distinct ways. And so I was very proud of Pearls as a space where these topics could be um, explored and asked and really critiqued and thought about rather than just sort of deferred to society. That's society's problem. That's not our, that's not our design problem. So um, 
wrapping up here, if my slides cooperate, uh, some lessons I learned uh, overall from my time at Berkeley. Uh, so the first one, um, you know, in dialogue with these two sort of, I gave you the kind of philosophical methodology, but then also this kind of social methodology. Um, the lesson I really did learn here was it's, it's critically important that you ask the research questions you want to ask. Being a grad student is an extremely vulnerable experience where you're often very alone. You're very isolated. You're constantly second guessing yourself and encouraged to look for approval um, from your advisor, from, from professors, uh, maybe from peers, but, but anywhere other than yourself, uh, I think is the watchword here. And the lesson I really learned from my time at Berkeley was that the kind of, maybe it's an ugly truth, but the kind of profound truth is that you should really, you should really, if you, if a question is keeping you up at night, you should pursue it. Um, it's, it's what you came to Berkeley to do. Uh, even if it's not conscious <laughs> and it's, it's really best to lean into that. And the reason is simply that the payoff for doing so is, is beyond actually what you can anticipate. Uh, because if you, if you assume that it's only the things I'm allowed to ask that I can't ask by definition, you're only going to give answers that people can expect. <laughs> and so there's an inherent limit to even how interesting that is and even what a contribution is. And sometimes you have to be willing to push in directions that maybe some people don't think you can go or don't want you to go. Um, and it's really a matter of, I think, falling into this kind of trusting flow that uh, that it's the right way to go. And it's ultimately going to pay off, even if uh, it's hard to say while it's happening what that will be. Um, and that's, that's really much of the journey and the adventure of grad school uh, as I experienced it. And then the second part, building off of that, uh, is that you may very well need to build a community to help you ask that question. <laughs> so um, it's often the case, I think, that the most burning questions, the most interesting questions, the most compelling questions are ones that no one really knows how to answer or even how to ask in a precise way. And that's okay. Um, that's not something to be ashamed of. That's not something to hide. That is something to lean into and it's something to breathe about. You know, you breathe it in, you breathe it out and you you come into an awareness of your question at the same time you're working to answer it. Um, and, you know, there's this famous proverb, which was one of my mantras in grad school uh, given to me by a friend of mine. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. <laughs> so for me, the the journey of designing my own PhD was was ironically what helped me connect to other students in this new way, uh, connect to other other people, other ideas, diverse ways of thinking. Uh, that if I hadn't if I hadn't done that, uh, I would have actually remained much more cloistered because I would have left myself accountable to um, some you know very specific and kind of isolated idea of of what it would mean to ask what beneficial AI is rather than just to say, well, I don't know if anybody really knows what it means right now. So let's just collect the diversity of thought on this and see what can alchemically emerge from that new kind of a space that we could organize. So I think there's a lot more I could say about these topics. And um, there's a lot, there is a lot more to say and a lot more uh, for me, uh, myself even to reflect on since I've graduated not that long ago, but I'll stop here and, you know, thank you again for this opportunity to give this presentation uh, and go Bears. Uh, happy to take questions at this time. <laughs> thank you very much. It's um, a lot to take in, I guess. From you. <laughs> yeah. So, Tom, I, I kind of agree with you that probably you're at the best place in the world to, to do your, your kind of research, you know, because you uh, to get the support that you need to further your research. But then the thing is, uh, so the, actually it has a lot to do with how you reward people's behavior, your, your reward system, right? So it depends on the, uh, on the system, you know, like on, I, I, I guess uh, there are different ways of rewarding people based on whether it, it provide the the best benefit to the individual, or you value more uh, the overall effect on society. Whether it's 
you know, like whether you maximize individual benefit or benefit of the society. So I guess this depends on the, on the system designer, right? So how do you, you know, uh, uh, how do you weigh you, which, which way would be, uh, mm. you know, would, would, should be implemented? Yeah, well, yeah, that is a good question. And it has this interesting resonance uh, with with pearls, <laughs> I guess, both in the sense that um, I took on, I think, a lot of personal risk to design my own PhD. There's just that kind of existential dimension of it. And then there's also the more formal modeling question of like, if grad school is a reinforcement learning system, how do you design rewards within that environment differently so that all these little graduate student agents uh, adopt the behaviors that will lead them towards um, whether that's community building, whether that's interdisciplinary stuff. And yeah, I think um, it's interesting. I think that if I reflect on my own journey, the the second half of that question, the reward structure, that actually was already changing, um, you know, and me even making this kind of leap of faith into my own self-designed degree program was, it, it felt very subjective and very personal at the time, but I, I was really doing it at a moment in the zeitgeist where this people were sensing like we really actually need to like take this seriously like ai ethics is no longer hypothetical um it, it's coming ai is coming i remember very specifically when AlphaGo defeated lee sadal in spring 2016 uh that had already happened and it was a major catalyst i'd been thinking about this for a long time but it was a catalyst for me to actually be like yeah i need to do something about this and so um although i did it was it was high risk high risk high reward for me i guess um and so it's an example where i think as a grad student it's important to recognize that there's more than one way to go through grad school uh and there's more than one definition of success and so there is at least some wiggle room for finding your own path as long as you have this kind of practical faith that um you know, a life well lived and research that is well done will find a home. And and the fact of the matter is that's true. Um, Berkeley is basically a supportive environment. It's it's a rich environment and high quality work will get seen, even if it does not fit into a, conve a conventional bin. At least that's my experience. Um, and I myself was surprised by it sometimes. I mean, another example would be... Um, you know, I I had spent a couple years at Chai, that research lab I mentioned earlier, pretty much taking notes, <laughs> pretty much learning. Uh, it was a learning space for me, not speaking up very much or very often. And I think in my third year, I finally decided, um, you know, I think I have to take another kind of a risk and start saying things, saying things that other people might not understand or might not agree with, but that kind of as an outsider, it's it's actually really important for me at this point to try to try and i started giving presentations i started speaking up i started publishing i started scheduling meetings i didn't have to and the payoff i think was i think much larger for chai even than it was for me because i now found graduate students coming to me saying oh i didn't know you were also thinking about this stuff i didn't know that i thought i was the only one staying up late at night you know, not able to sleep, thinking about the fact that we don't have a good definition of reward <laughs> uh, with respect to this problem or whatever it was. Uh, and then when I went to the Simons Institute, they were sort of saying like, oh, we didn't know that, you know, people like you existed, where you're like really trying to very deeply integrate these different ways of thinking, um, because that's what they were looking for. Like the Simons Institute uh, is a very itself a very interdisciplinary environment where they're trying to take foundational ideas of computer science, but really make them communicable, transferable to areas in that case of like law, economics, society. And that that was very aligned with what I had been trying to do for years. So, yeah, I think there needs to be a faith that Berkeley, at least Berkeley is a spongy enough environment where 
Um, even if what you want to do might not fit in a single box, there are lots of clusters of research and institutions within Berkeley that will eventually derive, I think, enormous pleasure and benefit from having these kinds of quirky people who are willing to spend years of their lives um, crafting something, uh, and then they'll they'll buy into it. Yeah, this is Stephen. Uh, very interesting talk, uh, and, and and I'm very interested in in the topic because I'm actually doing some work on beneficial AI, uh, and I was looking at your the sudden definition of reward versus the Andrew Ng's uh, uh, statement is actually uh, from a different perspective. You can look at it as a sudden statement as a statement for the production of AI systems, the people who are, shall we say, the, the, the producers and the providers, while Andrew was talking about more the right hand side, the community, and so on, and 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 connecting them is what I would call the AI value chain. It means the value that you're producing has to be directed at certain people or certain institu institutions or enterprises or societies. So it's go from left to right, and then more or less the the second one is more on the left side, while the Andrew one is more on the right side, and your pearls is actually uh, a connection between the two, which is, in your terminology, is like connecting the North Campus with the South Campus. Am I on the right track? Uh, yes, that's right. So yeah, it's a kind of, um, it's a kind of a hindsight is always 2020 type situation, right? So like, I think when, when the reward hypothesis was kind of taking off years ago, um, it was kind of seen as by, by people who believed in it, it was kind of seen as the Holy grail of like, okay, all we need is the right definition of reward. And then the system will learn that and be perfect. And that's it. <laughs> like there's no, that's it. There's no, you don't need to worry about deployment. You don't need to worry about like anything beyond just having the right formal model. Um, because that was the, for many people, that was the promise of reinforcement learning. And then in parallel to that, you had people who were proselytizing, uh, and it was a very it was very hypey at the time. I didn't. I think many people couldn't quite know that, but it, in retrospect, it was very hypey. People arguing that you know self driving cars are going to come, you know, in a year, uh, they'll be here. Uh, they'll be. You can just call one; it'll come pick you up and do this stuff. And sometimes intermingled with those articles were, were these statements, like like Andrew Ings of him saying, like admitting. Um, like, yeah, there are going to be edge cases, you know, if there's like a plastic bag uh, rolling across the road or a tumbleweed, you know, unless we've had a human label that they're not, you know, it, whatever. So what we need to do is like make roads such that there aren't those objects on them. <laughs> and so it's like, I was like, well, wait, um, this could be really bad. <laughs> like this in combination with these designers, the, the problem was they weren't talking to each other. There, there wasn't this idea that um, as you call it, the value chain, there wasn't an idea that there, there needed to be a chain. There was this idea that maybe if we just get this part like of values right, we don't need to worry about the world. Which like in the history of philosophy, it's very platonic. It's very much this idea that you can just sort of retreat inward to kind of this realm of pure thinking yeah. and just and just see the good. And you don't like, not only do you not have to engage the world, you shouldn't because the world is confusing. It's, it's muddled with stupid people who, who don't know what the good is. And so that's why people are poor. And that's why people like there's this kind of aristocratic deductivist idea of ethics, in many ways ended up being what my what I was arguing against. And so my thesis actually ended up being this kind of anti platonic argument about what values are in the context of AI. But yes, I agree with you that there needed to be this in middle layer to make these tensions in dialogue with each other, to make these worlds um, aware of each other and intermingle and have an awareness of that without forcing them to be conflated or allowing them to be at war with each other, which again, that was sort of my story of Euclid versus <laughs> Euclid versus Telegraph here. And so I think um, 
again, we're still coming into an awareness of this. It's very, it's not a strictly intellectual question. It's really more about what do we even want a society building AI to look like and feel like? Yeah, so your, your, your example of the uh, driving example is very good because there is one company that's actually depend on AI in a local sense. That means they, they the car and the software recognize what is around them and react to them versus another company or a group of company that's doing a lot of large scale machine learning to figure out, you know, what, you know, what the environment looks like in the past and trying to input that into the software versus, you know, the macro scale versus the micro scale. And there's still a lot of debate going on, but, but as, 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 as you mentioned, the micro scale is a, a small part of the value chain, right? While the, the macro view trying to, to be a bit grander view, but is impossible to cover everything. You know, in in their in their things, yeah. It's a very interesting topic. Yeah, mm -hmm. Tom, what what's your outlook for a pearl going forward? Uh, it looks like you already started to build a community. Um, how do you hold it together, or, or what what can you do more with it? I guess. Yeah, I'm asking myself that question right now. So we. Um, if I recall, so to go into the timeline a little bit here, Pearls launched when I was affiliated with the Simons Institute, and that was fall 2020, um, which the image just came to mind in my head of like, I think actually the week that I decided to do it, uh, <laughs> to, to launch it was the week when we didn't have, um, it was, as I call it, the day without a sun. There was a day <laughs> when there was so much smoke in the Bay Area because of the wildfires that there effectively just was not a sun that day. And so the whole day was kind of red and brown and this, it was, it was extremely bizarre. Um, and so it was, that's, that for me was like the darkest part of COVID was that, that, that week in particular, maybe. And um, I, but I made this decision. We did a reading group there uh, for that semester. I expanded it in 20, early 2021. And then we finally did this workshop in December of 2021 and I graduated from Berkeley that August. So technically the workshop was just in the months after my graduation. Um, and then over 2022, I kept thinking like, yeah, what what's next? Like, what do we, how do we keep this energy going? Um, and so what I ended up doing was kind of being like taking a lot of the ideas and insights and conversations we'd had and distilling those things into some research deliverables. So we published, a, uh, I should say Geese kind of published a white paper on uh, reward reports. So it's a it's a new approach to AI documentation that is specifically taking inspiration from reinforcement learning and meant to document the kinds of problems I've been talking about in this presentation. So how would you document how a system is performing over time uh, and in relation to what its goal is, its reward, rather than just in terms of what its model happens to be at a particular moment in time. So it's a kind of paradigm shift in what we even want from documentation of AI make it more like how we document environmental impacts in other settings or how we how we check up on bridges to make sure they're up to code and don't fall down. So there were deliverables in that direction. Uh, and, and then over the course of 2022, uh, reinforcement learning had a bit of a, I don't know if breakthrough is the right word, but a bit of a moment. It was kind of like the, 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 the debutante coming down the stairs at the ball <laughs> where everyone's like, ooh, my God, it's a thing. Uh, because now we have chat GPT, we have, uh, you know, new, new image generators. Uh, it's, it's likely, I don't want to make any firm predictions, but we're probably going to see video generators in mm -hmm. the not too distant future. So you can just type into some prompt like, oh, you know, write me a sitcom where it's Seinfeld, but 20 years later, and you'll just have a system that could do that and it'll film it and it'll have a script uh, I, it's weird, but I don't think it's that far away. And RL and RL from human feedback is really a lot of the way those systems are going to be built. And so there's a lot of very interesting questions really just in the last few months emerging around, um, not just how do you align an RL system with some domain, but how do you integrate human feedback into it in a way that is responsible, accountable, uh, and like 
governmentally sound uh like how do you approximate governance in the context of a, of a system like that rather than just siphon data for the sake of some technocratic um control over what this model's success means and so we're going to be relaunching a, i'm relaunching a reading group uh on pearls that starts later this month and we're going to be reading critically reading uh some some stuff together that's been published on rl recently and also in the AI ethics uh, space, because I think there are certain schools of thought uh, that have had a reckoning uh, in the last few months uh, that I think is very exciting and very, very kind of compelling and that needs to be taken seriously. So my watchword is um, kind of keep keep pearls weird, <laughs> as they say about the city of Austin, except don't, keep Austin weird, keep pearls weird, keep pearls this kind of quirky place where the kind of dominant paradigm of how this stuff is built right now can get questioned, but can get questioned in this kind of constructive way. Can you envision that you can potentially uh, look for funding for certain maybe research projects within Pearl? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so over the course of my PhD, several projects within, well, so, several things adjacent to Pearls were supported by the Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity I mentioned that Pearls itself was funded with support from the Simons Institute. So Simons was aware that I was doing this and organizing these groups and having these conversations. And they were very encouraging of that. And they they gave funding for us to buy up some books for us to kind of sink our teeth, teeth into uh, to start off. Um, and then, yeah, the CLTC came after that and they funded and supported our launch of this white paper on reward reports. Um, and then, yeah, there is additional funding that we've sought and are still seeking uh, from organizations in 2023 to really, again, the goal is to, um, it's to create space for critical and constructive inquiry. That's the kind of watchword. So mm -hmm. there, the deliverables could be papers. They could also be prototype design prototypes um, or uh, attempts at a new methodology for integrating human feedback into an RL system. Um, there's several different dimensions to explore. And actually, I, I will have some news on that front uh, that's not public very soon. Okay, good. good. Okay. Hey, uh, uh, Tom. So how many active participants are in uh, groups like Pearl and Geese? You know, have mm. the, the number of participants increased or decreased over, over time? Um. I think geese has stayed pretty constant. It's pretty, it's pretty small. It's kind of, um, and that's where its energy I think comes from. So geese is, I think it's always been around five. Uh, the numbers fluctuated up or down slightly, but it's really been, there were about five of us in the course that more it's taught. I should mention that rule Dabe was, um, the kind of, I, I affectionately call him the George Washington of geese because he was sort of the one who was really noticing that, we were all making eye contact in this class and he was sort of like, he was, he was just finishing his PhD in EECS that year. And uh, he was like, there really needs to be a community like this that we start. And so we all started together. Uh, Rule is now a professor in the Netherlands at Delft. Uh, the original team, it was Rule, myself, Sarah Dean, um, and uh, Nitten, who was also in the class and McCain, uh, so I think that's five and we've all now gone on to do, you know, our own very interesting things. And, and then Nate joined later uh, and also Tom Zick uh, joined later. And so that that's, that's been relatively constant. Pearls is larger. Um, it's not huge. It's not hundreds of people, but I would say for the reading groups, we've consistently had around 20 or 30 people uh, for these regular meetings where we discuss this stuff, these themes um, and then for the workshop, I think it was maybe more like triple digits in terms of the attendance and the participants. Um, and I think that's about right. 